Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Find Me in a Book podcast. I'm your host, Tab. Welcome to episode four. This book, unfortunately, but fortunately, it is book one. And book two is already out, which is great because I'm going to read that real fast. And next week's podcast is going to be about book two. The book is A Court of Honey and Ash. And the funny thing is I started reading it and then my sister, honestly, like 20 minutes later was like, oh my gosh, have you read this book? And she sent me a screenshot and I was like, wait, that's weird. I am literally reading it right now. As for the sister-mother standard, sister, definitely, uh, because she read it before I did. And mother, yes, I think she, she would really like it. But again, fantasy and this type of era is not her jam. But we're definitely, we meaning me and my sister, are definitely trying to get her into more fantasy books. And I think that this would be a great series already to get her into. So hopefully one day she will read it. As for the spicy side, not really. There's like some sexual tension, but there's no like toast scenes. Uh, remember, we call sex toast because I am a child. So there's no toast scenes. There's like a couple kissing, which is great. But yeah, other than that, Hopefully next book we see a little bit more spiciness, but for this one, it's pretty tame, which is really great. As for swearing, there are a couple F words. You are very easily able to skip over it, which is great. If you want to know more about this series, A Court of Honey and Ash, which is part of the Honey and Ice series, then definitely keep on listening. We start out the book with learning that this person, we don't know her name yet, is in the final test of this brutal training. This group is called the Untried. I guess during this training, if you pass, then you are called tried after that. Everyone grew up knowing about this training. Already in this book, we find out that she's half fae, half human. They're in this different world training so that they know where to sort them in the fae world. So if you're not aware of fae or don't know very much about fae, Usually in these books, there are seely fae and there are unseely fae. So we're going to find out where she fits in, what side she's on, and go from there. So they're in this training, and this training is for eight years, which we learn later that, yes, the training is for eight years, but in the outside world, it is only four years. So they only basically lose four years of outside experiences, you could call it. They're in this world uh, called the Underhill. And the Underhill is the ancestral home of the Fae. It is very unpredictable. The terrain changes. This is where they have their last challenge. This is where they also had their training. So they leave the outside world, go to Underhill, go through this training, and now they are at this final challenge. And this final challenge, or the overall mission, is to collect the coins hidden on the course. But of course, there's like monsters involved. During this, we're also introduced to Yaro, who is like the self-appointed leader. He's just an a-hole already. Like, we don't like him. Then we learn about Bracken, who she is just this whole time, it sounds like she's been crying the whole time. She's just not made out for these tests. She was forced to go into this training. And so we don't have high hopes for her. We also learn that the main character, her name is Allie. Yaro, of course, is an a-hole and calls her mutt. And so they are going through this first course, which it's a forest. And all of a sudden, this three-headed dragon pops up. They're shooting arrows. They're taking down this dragon. And they get to like the chest where these coins are. She realizes that it's not like collect the happy coins as a team thing. It's like get your coin or you're gonna be out. The Underhill, which is this ancestral home, is changing because they got their coins, they they defeated the dragon, time to go to the next. And so the sand is shifting under their feet as they run and it's it morphs to like cold, wet, heavy. So literally the ocean appears in front of them. And she's trying to keep like her expression clear so that people can't see her panic because an old memory pops up, which kind of gives you the the idea that she probably almost drowned in water. And so she gets in there. It's so cold. She couldn't breathe. These challenges, they're the three main challenges. So they go from weapons, bravery, and mind. 
And the first one was obviously weapons because they had to take the dragon down with weapons. And she's pretty convinced that bravery is this one, but all the other people are like, no, 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 this is mind. The chest with the coins are like deep underwater. And so we have to hold our breath. It's, it's of the mind. And with being fey or half fey, they don't have to breathe as much as humans or they can like hold their breath more. So she goes down to the, the bottom of the ocean and she takes a coin and then she turns around and Yarrow has caught up to her. She like backpedals bumping into an octopus. It's like they don't actually say octopus. They say like a tentacled monster, which basically is an octopus, but it's like large, like a big sea creature. She's trying to get away. It's not paying her any attention. And instead it's turning to the other untried. And she's like, am I too close for it to see it? And so she snags the last silver coin. She swims up to the surface. Bracken is already there. So as they're running, because they're running to the next course, they got these silver coins the foliage is changing and like the footing as well so basically it changes to like a steep rock face so they make it up the cliff and yarrow is there yarrow says like oh as troop leader and says that ladies go first although i'm not sure the word replies to like someone of your dubious heritage basically he's being an a-hole she's like okay why would they want us to go first like something must real dangerous be like around the corner or whatever and so they like walk up to this edge and it's a huge waterfall just straight down hundreds of feet into a, a pool of water and so as she's looking she feels hands shove her basically why Yarrow was like oh you go first so she gets shoved off of this test and she makes it into the water but there is magic at play she lands very softly and yeah as she lands in the water it's not hard it doesn't hurt and basically ju she just floats so she's like oh that's what it took was bravery to jump. Okay, so then she swims right over to the chest. Uh, they're gold coins now. And she took one of them and then she took another for Bracken too. All of them had jumped, but she still isn't seeing Bracken. And then Bracken finally jumps and and she comes out of the water. She's like, you know what? All the coins were gone, but I thought I'd jump anyways. That's when Allie like hands her the coin. She's like, oh, I got you one. So now Bracken has two coins and Allie has three coins. That's when they like call it. They only have like the three challenges. And so Bress, his name is Bress, I believe. He was one of the trainers. He comes out and basically like congratulates them and says like, hey, those with three coins will enter into the elite of the Sealy. You'll receive like training in the area of your choosing along with a stipend, your own home, a crest, and two human servants. Which honestly, that sounds like a good time. Like you get your own house house you get a stipend i'm not super mad at the two human servants like i would love if people could clean my house and then those people with two coins will enter into the middling of the sealy so you'll receive training in like the area of your choosing along with half stipend shared accommodations with those of your status and then those with one coin you'll be trained as tradespeople and given shared accommodation with those of your status and so then people that don't have any coin they're like oh automatically of course they're going to be cast out to what they call the triangle so everyone's like expecting this and all of a sudden Bress is like and those with no coins will also become tradespeople so everyone is kind of like uh what like okay I guess they don't want to cast them out um because fey numbers are so low and human numbers are so high and then he's like okay now like you have to take your oath to the king which we'll be doing that later but right now you need to take your oath to the oracle and we learned that most people have already met the oracle because they meet them at the time of their sorting and the sorting means that when they become a certain age they're sorted into like seely or unseely court depending on like their magic but because we learn Allie was put into training much earlier than usual she was never sorted so as these people are going and kneeling in front of the oracle one by one then it's finally Allie's turn the oracle demands her hand which she holds out her right hand and she pricks the palm of it with the crystal knife the oracle says swear your oath now Kalik and may the goddess help us for what comes after the oracle drives the crystal blade into the ground at Allie's feet which she didn't do that for anyone else. That's when Allie says her oath. She says, I, Calic of no house, do swear to protect and uphold the laws of the Underhill. She says, I bind my soul to her power. I bind my sword to obey the 
the orders of King Alexander. And should I ever fail in this, then I shall forfeit my place in this world, the Underhill, and whatever lies beyond. So all of a sudden, all like all her magic rolls into her and does an outward blasting wave as the earth like basically heaves. And all of a sudden the Underhill is like going crazy. So it's changing from jungle, water, sand, honey, cloud, thorns, ice. So basically think of like the Hunger Games and how they were in like those different settings. This is exactly what's happening. So it's changing to all these different settings and it's being extreme. In the eight years that they've been there, nothing like this has ever happened. Allie looks up and her gaze is into the Oracle and the Oracle says, Underhill is no more Calic of No House. You have destroyed it. So that's the first chapter. So you're like, oh my gosh, like there's this ancestral home that people go to that train or go to to like refresh their magic and all of a sudden she destroyed it. Like I was confused at first because I didn't know if this was like a whole different type of world. I didn't know when this was taking place. And so we'll find out that in just a little bit. All of a sudden, Bress is like, everyone get inside. And there's like this big cabin that they've stayed at. And so he like takes everyone inside because the underhill is just kind of going crazy. And there's this huge storm that they're trying to be safe from. And um, across from them are two other troops with like trainers. There's another Sealy group and one unsealy group. They of course have never seen each other before because there's different groups throughout the underhill that go for the training. And so as they're waiting out this storm, they start to ask like the trainers more questions. And one of the trainer is like, underhill's not gone. The birth place of our magic and our source of power doesn't just disappear. And she looks at this trainer a little bit more and she starts to think of her friend that he reminds her of that was sorted into the dark court. So like the unseelie court. And she, and a memory comes up of her mother where they snuck from part of like their island to spy on fey festivities. Because remember she's half fey, half human. So her mom is human and her dad was Faye. At this point was like five years old and her mom starts to talk with like the, a group of elders, like as she's a little girl, says like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna just go look. I'll, I'll be right back, I'll be right back. So she like peeks over this like hill and watches all these like fey festivities because I think it's like the equinox or something like that. All of a sudden there's this couple that rides up on these horses and everyone is just so enamored with them. And then all of a sudden like the children start lining up. They have flowers in their hands. They're going to be meeting the, the woman who was on the horse and she's just a beautiful, beautiful woman. And so they were like lining up. And so Allie's like, oh, I'm gonna do this because she's only five years old. She doesn't like super know. She reaches the bridge where there's only a few children left in front of her. She gives her flower to this woman. And the woman just like looks at her like, oh, thank you. Like kind of surprised. So as Allie is walking away, a rock gets kicked into her path and she trips over it and she stumbles sideways. So this is the memory that Allie is remembering when she's going into the ocean to get her coin. She fell over a bridge and she is being dragged down because of like her clothes. And so she's basically drowning. And all of a sudden this, this, there's this boy that grabs her and brings her up, it saves her basically. And she says like the pretty boy's eyes were black, just like his hair, water dripped and he asked if she's okay. And we learned that the language of her mother is Tinglet and he talked to her in Fey language and which is kind of an interesting thing that her mom like made her learn Fey language and this Tinglet. He says like, I'll take her back to her people, uh, the his father or whatever, or the people that are around her are like, oh, he's just like his grandfather. And we learn later on that his grandfather's name, I think is Lou, and he was like a hero of the Sealy Corps. It goes back to present day where Allie is rubbing the scar on her finger where that unseely boy had saved her life. Because remember the, the trainer reminded her of this unseely boy. They decide the next day, the whole group, that they need to go back into the room real world. And this is where we start to learn more about this world and what timing and everything like that. And so they say, since the Fae had come out to the human populace roughly a hundred years before, so right after the end of World War II, people had encouraged the old belief that Fae couldn't lie and that they were like gentle folk. So they, the Fae had split their people up all over the world to keep their numbers down and make it easier for the humans to trust them. So they, they head back into the real world and they go on this private jet. So obviously it's like 
yeah, nowadays where they have private jets. And then we learn a little bit more about Allie is that she is a bastard and left by her father's guards at the orphanage, which we're like, wait, father's guards? Like, what does that mean? Like, do these Fae have guards usually? And she doesn't talk to her dad at all because he ordered his minions to chuck her in an orphanage, claiming that her mother died and she has a stepmother that just loathes her. Once they get off the jet, one of the trainers is like, your attention newly tried of Unimac, which Unimac is the island that they live on, which is split between Sealy and Unsealy. And we learn that it's actually in Alaska or just off of Alaska, like by the Bering Sea, I think they said. And this trainer says, you've earned your place among us and it'll be recognized. There'll be a feast in your honor tomorrow night at King Alexander's castle where all the Sealy will look upon you and you've like earned your right to choose your training. Like you'll announce your decision there at the feast. Then all of a sudden Allie's like, dang, I hate seeing my father. So we're like, wait, what? And he, he hated her seeing too. And it's not public knowledge who her father was, which she's like, I'm, I'm, I don't believe it myself sometimes. So She's the bastard daughter of the king. That's kind of shocking because it's like, wait, okay, her mom is human. Her dad is the freaking king of the Sealy court. The trainer goes and meets with each person and says like, oh, where you'll be living, everything like that. And then he kind of pulls her aside and he's like, what happened to Underhill? And she tells him like, I made this oath. The Oracle drove the blade with my blood on it. Like, I, I don't know what happened after that. Like, after cutting me, I think she cut herself too. And then she puts it in the ground. Everyone was behind her, so nobody really saw what was happening. And so then he's like, okay, like, we'll figure it out. And he walks away. And so as she's like walking down to her new house, she sees her best friend. Her name is Hycynthia, Hycynth or something. I think it's like the flower, but she calls her Synth. Her friend is a baker. She works in like the castle kitchen because it's only been four years for her and eight years in the Underhill, then they're pretty much the same age now. And we find out that they were orphans together and that's how they've known each other their whole lives. Since parents lost their minds to the madness and tried to like slaughter some of the king's guards like 10 years back. And so um, that's how she ended in the orphanage with Allie. We follow along with Allie and she's running through the different sectors of Unimok. And she's going towards the River Diane, which was the divider between the Sealy and Unsealy. And basically following that, you can find your way around the island. You could also land yourself in the world of humans, which is the world of her mother. So it sounds like this island is basically separated into three things. So Sealy, Unsealy, and then there's humans on there which is probably, there's probably only like a small amount of humans on this island. And so she's running through trying to get to like the human side and all of a sudden she hears voices. And so she immediately dodges behind this tree. She hears someone say like, what do you mean Underhill is gone? That's not possible. A trick from the Sealy. Alexander knows we outnumber them. And she's like, what do you think, young Folin? You grew up here. Could this be a ruse they put into play? And that's when Allie's like, whoa, Folin is here? Like, he was eight years older than her when she left for training. And this is the kid that, that saved her while drowning. And also, she had a major, major crush on him. Because, of course, he's brooding and has good looks. And then it flashes back to another memory where they're in the orphanage. Her and Synth are in the in the orphanage and the matriarch person is saying like hey they're bringing in kids um to buddy with these orphanages and synth is like yeah they're bringing kids with parents to buddy with us makes rich people feel better about themselves i think and so these kids come in and folin is one of them and that's when Allie recognizes him. Like, he's the one that saved me from the river. Uh, so Folin comes over to her and is like, hi, I'm Folin, grandson of Lou. And she's like, oh, I'm Calic of No House. Perhaps we can get through this together. What do you say? The older that they got, 
like they had spent a lot of time together because of like this orphanage program. The older that they got, the more distance he put between them, which only made her crush like a million times worse. He had been actually sorted into the unseelie court two years before she left for training and she didn't know anything after that. Uh, because there was no mixing between the two courts. I guess it's strictly forbidden. The day before she was to leave to training, she got drunk. I guess she was 16 years old. I don't know drinking age for the Fae. It's whatever. So she was 16 years old and she made a fool of herself. So she was at this pub and it allows Celia and Unsealing on the premises and she knew it was like the last time she was going to see him for a long time. He just always treated her like she was a little girl, always making a fool of herself. And so she's like drunk, goes up to him and is like, oh, so I'm not good enough because I'm half human. Is that right? He is. He had started calling her orphan and not by her name. And so he's like, orphan, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh, I'm going to training tomorrow. And he's like, Ugh, like you're too young, orphan. Uh, too young to go to training by two years, too weak to survive, you're a little girl, go be in the kitchen with, a, the kitchen with your friends. So he's just being like really rude. And so she like grabs his arm, jerks him around, and she closes her eyes to plant like a kiss on him, except for it didn't feel right. And she opens her eyes and she had kissed his left eye. And so she like got made fun of. And of course, this is an experience that she just like, it just makes her cringe. And so it's been eight years since she's seen him and the eye kissing scene. And so it comes back to like the present day. This lady is talking some more and they found out that it's Queen Queen Elisavana, which is the queen of the Unseelie. Like, what is she doing across the river? Like, what is she doing with Folin? So they, she watches her like go back across the river and she hears something behind her and she like strikes out. Uh, it's Folin and she like hits him in the, in the face and he's like, orphan, is that you? And she's like, uh, you shouldn't be on the side of the river. You could be in trouble. He's like, hey, did you hear about Underhill? Um, and she's like, okay, this is obviously the only reason he's talking to me because he knew, he knew where I was and when, like, and so she kind of plays dumb and is like, oh, hear what? And he's like, you would have been there when it happened. Something has happened to Underhill and like the rest of Faye, I want to know what. And she says, I'm just out here to see my mom. So if you don't mind, I'd like to be left alone. He doesn't follow her after that no no fae willingly crosses the divide basically and she goes to this tomb or like stones that have been piled up and and that's where her mom is laid to rest so we do learn that her mom is for sure dead it's just kind of like this memorial that she goes to visit so then she gets back to her house and she's getting ready and the last time that she saw her father was afar when she was 16 and he, she was actually on a convoy uh, with other 16 year olds that were brought to the castle to be sorted into the Celia and Unseelie. And she had spotted him like from the window. And then immediately after that, they plucked her from the trolley, sent her back to the orphanage. And that's where the matron or the matriarch or whatever informed her that she was leaving for Underhill training the next day, two years earlier than most, which is kind of like the more that I think about it, it's kind of suspicious where it's like, okay, why did he not want her to be sorted? She was sent to training early. That's, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. Someone comes out and they say, here's the king and queen, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, the king will now hear your choices. And so they like each take turns. She goes up, she makes eye contact with him. The, the consort or the stepmom or whatever, just is like glaring at her the whole time. And so Ali says, protector of a fae ambassador. So she is going to be attending like negotiations with humans and unseelie fae as this ambassador. And then they, they start to feast. As Ali is eating, she looks and she sees that the concert, her name is Adair. She crosses the stage and goes to Bress, which is the trainer. And they start talking and everything. And all of a sudden Adair's expression goes like really grim. And that's when Ali starts to worry, like, okay, um, is he telling her about the Underhill? Like what happened? They all of a sudden like turn and look at her. So she's like, okay, obviously my stepmom knew or 
and now she like suspects that I was the one who shattered Underhill. And she sees that Bress is like takes a quick glance to the guards and that makes Allie like super worried like okay I think I need to leave before anything happens. And so she like gets up slowly like she makes her way to the kitchens which is where Synth is and she's like hey I need you to hide me. And Synth, of course, is like her best friend. She's like, uh, obviously, yeah, I definitely will. And so they switch clothes. And so then Allie like takes off. She goes to like her new house to go get her money. So then she starts thinking of like, okay, where, where do I go? Like, what do I do? And the only place left open to her was the one that was taught to fear from childhood. Um, and basically the place the orphanage used as nightmares to keep them in check. And even like lately the humans have learned to fear and it was the triangle. So we start to learn more about the triangle. So Allie makes it to the airport. There's like this cargo plane that she tries to get on, which she makes it onto there. And they land at the Fairbanks in Alaska. They land at the airport. And so Fairbanks puts her towards the east section of the Alaska Triangle, which covers like the land area between Juneau to the east and Anchorage to the south and Barrow at the very northern tip of the state. So that's kind of the triangle. And until recently, the triangle had contained the underhill. So she makes it off the plane very sneakily. She makes it into the building. All of a sudden there is like these five security guards and they and they stop her. And she plays dumb and she's like, oh, is this the terminal? Like there's no guide. The one of the guards is like, uh, there's no other passenger on the plane that just came in. Like the pilot, co-pilot, and one passenger. That's it. She's like, oh well, like I like just playing dumb, like, oh, we need to go get this sorted out. And then all of a sudden they hear you oh you found my assistant and she turns and it's this giant caribou i mean in our day we're like uh what but i guess the humans there are used to it because they're they're used to fey and so there's this talking caribou the security is like wait she's with you and, and he's like correct might we proceed like i've already cleared her paperwork and so as they're walking towards this vehicle so her and this caribou and so he introduces himself as uh rubazal he's like you know what like all of us who live here. I'm an outcast fae. I sent this creature to attend a meeting as my vessel with a Sealy ambassador, but when I caught wind that a young fae woman ha was running from Unimok, I postponed my meeting to meet you. And he's like, but why, why are you here? And she's like, well, I'm looking for the entrance to Underhill, actually. Do you know where I can find it? Could you help me? And he's like, even better, like, I can show you in person. You would need to drive to meet me, though. And so she's like, okay, like, why are you helping me? And he's like, oh, you can call me Ruby. And he's like, I don't want anything from you, but your power does interest me. And she's like, okay, this is the second time he's mentioned my power, or he keeps describing it as, like, unusual. And so they get to this vehicle, and he's like, hey, this car contains a map. We leave it here for newly outcast Faye, so you can take it without concern. Like, the key is in the ignition. So she, like, gets in this car and starts following this map. She, like, turns on the radio a little bit, and then all of a sudden she hears like voices whispering her name and all of a sudden it's a uh, synth's voice that snaps through the radio and she's like what the hell Allie like she's like I can't tell I can't hear if you're talking to me and she's like where are you have you lost your mind like decided to throw your whole life away and then Synth says like I'm on my way like Jackson knows the pilots and they told him that they saw you so he got me a flight out and she's like I'm gonna be in Fairbanks like you better be there immediately Allie turns around and goes back to the airport because she's like oh, I can't just leave Cynthia there or Synth there and so she gets there and Synth is like on the side of the road and so Allie like opens the door and says like why did you follow me like you I don't want you to get yourself cast out like you've worked way too hard to be in the royal kitchens. And Synth is, a, is like, it's not your choice, Gallic. They get to like this, this cafe that Ruby says to meet him at. They go into this little cafe bar type thing and the bartender immediately stands out. He's over seven feet tall and has blue skin. And so she goes up to the bar and she's like, I need something strong to take off the edge, please. And a menu. And he's like, okay, well, I'll bring you some of my home brew, my ogre brew. And then the next page is her waking up and, and is like, what happened? <laughs> and Cynthia is like, okay, so I thought I saw, have seen you drunk before, but consider me proven wrong. Synth is like, 
Yeah, Ruby showed up. Um, he didn't seem in a rush though, and I told him that it was in the best time. Uh, just because he like peeked through the window and you had started a karaoke night, which only you attended. Oh yeah, also he's a giant. Like the ground shakes when he moves. She's like, okay, I need to take a shower. And Synth is like, okay, well, Ruby says to meet him at like the last river crossing before like a, this certain coal mine. Allie goes and showers, comes out the bathroom door. She looks up and Fulwin is right there. He says, I told you last night, um, uh, that was right before you danced in front of me for an hour. Fulwin was there while she was drunk and had tracked her down. And she's like, okay, can you just tell me why you're here? Like, I'm not in the mood to play your stupid games. He's like, okay, well, as I told you last night, I am here with a group of Unseelie investigating what happened to the Underhill. And it'd just be easier if you just told me what you know. And he's like, Underhill has to be restored. Like you've heard rumors of what can happen to us without it. So that makes her wonder like, okay, are you implying that the Fae really do go manic without Underhill? And he's like, well, we'd be foolish to dismiss the possibility. Like we have to make sure that we get Underhill back. Then they talk about how Fulin is the descendant of the Seelie Fae hero, Lou, and it surprised everyone when Fulin was sorted into um, the Unseelie Corp. And so he asks her, why did you leave? What happened? And she's like, oh, uh, well, simple story. Like, I cast myself out. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's hard to believe. Like, that's not what happened. Like, why would you do that? You emerged from training as an elite. You had your pick of everything. Kind of strange that you just throw it away unless you had another reason to run. And he says, like, he questions her and is like, you want to live in the triangle where there's nothing but the worst our world has to offer? So then he he leaves. Her and Synth decide to go to the mine early because she wants to scope it out before Ruby gets there. And as they're driving, there's like this white static that comes onto the radio and it's like men and women whispering in unison, but it's not in English and it's not in Fae. It's in Tinglet, the language of her mother. Allie can still speak it fluently. She doesn't know anyone else that can speak it. And so this voice is saying, death is rising among us, Calic. Stop the children of the moon before they destroy us all. The spirits are angry, but they will guide you. Basically, she's like, um, what just happened? They just said this to me and the Unseelie, their crest is of the moon. So it's like, okay, are the Unseelie the children of the moon? Like what's happening? So they get to the mine and Allie makes Synth stay there. And as Allie walks out, a guy stumbles out of a building and he's like, wait, why are you doing here? Like there's an evacuation order. Like you can't be here. The giants are coming. We have drones up to like keep an eye on things. And last time they were here, they killed the entire crew. And so he like leaves and she's like, okay, well, those are probably the people that I'm looking for. And she looks around and all of a sudden there's 10 of them approaching. So they're each like 12 feet tall. And so she yells to them like, hey, I'm here to speak to Rubizal. Is one of them you? They just look at her and then all of a sudden one of them does like a roar and like rushes her. And she's like, I'm here to speak to Ruby. Either you play nice and tell me where he is or like things are gonna go down. And they don't say anything. So she's like attacking, like they're attacking her. She's attacking them. All of a sudden she's like, Lou, help me, because that's like kind of a exclamation. And it says like, oh, but it wasn't Lou that she got. So Folan showed up and he's like, how did you piss off giants within 30 minutes of me seeing you? She's like, well, they attacked me. And then she's like, let's turn them on each other because I don't think they're in the right mind. Somehow they like turn them against each other. So these ogres are basically fighting each other or not ogres, they're giants. They're fighting each other. And all of a sudden the ground starts to shake. The giants that were fighting each other, they fall apart because they're not fighting anymore um, in response to like the new threat. She like watches this huge giant, just over 20 feet tall, exiting the tree line. His gray beard was scraggly, like extreme and reaches knees where these like smaller giants were very thick thighed and muscular. This guy, he was very lean, knee joints, knobbly, and he possessed like an air of fragi fragility, Fra fragileness. Like basically he was old as dirt and he had this gleaming gold harp on his back and he comes up to them and he asks like, did they attack you? 
And the largest of the, the fighting giants, like, growled at, we obviously know this is Ruby, but, like, growled at Ruby. That's when Ruby takes his harp and strums a few notes, and all of a sudden, the giants all calm down. He's like, the demise of Underhill has affected us, of, us all faster than people think, and especially, like, the younger they are. So as they're walking, Ruby and Allie are just talking to each other, and Allie asks him, like, are you the leader of the outcast then? And he's like, uh, protector. I've never sought to lead. And he's like, okay, well, why don't you stay here? Like, let me help you with your magic. Let me help you understand it. And she says, you know what? I'm not super ready to settle here, but I would definitely like help with my magic, which is fair. They're just talking some more and he does this like whistle. And all of a sudden this guy like pops up um, and he has, I think he has like a mask on or something, but like Basically, he looks like this assassin. He takes off his helmet and she's like, Drake? We don't know anything about Drake at this point, but we do learn right after this that he was in the training with Allie, but he was only there for a couple months because he got accused of stealing this balm, like this healing balm. The leaders like punished him and they actually cut off his hand. And so he had been expelled to the to be an outcast and was there in the triangle. And so he tells her like, oh, is Yarrow still alive? And so they talk about how they hate him. He's like, yeah, actually Yarrow pinned everything on me. He was the one that stole the healing bomb, which is so frustrating. So we, we hate Yarrow even more because he, he made Drake like lose his hand for something he didn't do. They basically have a vendetta against Yarrow, which is completely understandable. The next morning, Allie convinces Drake to take her to the opening of where the Underhill was, even though he's like, no, 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 Ruby said that he would take you, but you know, she convinces him he's attractive, she's attractive, and they kind of like flirt, and so she convinces him to take her. They go to this area, so she like closes her eyes and she stretches her magic out as if like seeing with her magic and opening it. And so she calls to Drake and was like, the area seems really drained of life. Like, and so then they start hearing, they hear some voices by them and they're like, oh, quickly, like into the trees. So they're in these trees hiding their magic. They hear this voice that says like, we've already searched here. What's the point of coming back? And they freeze because it is Yarrow. So they're like, why is Yarrow here in the triangle? Both her and Drake were like, we want to kill him. Like, we're very upset, but they tell each other, like, no, 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 we can't. There's a better way. Like, why he's there, we don't know. Later that night, she can't get to sleep. Like, she's just has so much on her mind. And then she hears something and she sees a fae, like, shadowing. And so she goes and, like, attacks him. And it's Foland. She, like, heads, headbutts him. And she thinks that she's, like, seeing stars, but it's actually her magic that had, like, flared. And all these like ribbons of color shooting around her. And his actually did the same thing as well and responded to her. So basically their magic is like coiling around each other. And she starts to like hear his thoughts. Like, why are you here? What are you doing with the strays? What's made you run so far from everything you ever wanted? And, and like he also takes her memory from the recent past of like what what she's been replaying over and over, like what happened with the Oracle and everything. And finally, like their magic untangles. They're like, well, this is why they say like Seely and Unseely like can't be together. So she, she tells him about everything that ha happened. She says like, do you believe me? Or are you going to take me off to like an early grave? And he's like, let's do option C. And she's like, wait, uh, what's option C? Like, and what did you just do with your magic that pulled this memory from me? Like what, like what just happened? And he's like, well, option C means that you work with me to figure out like why this happened, like the Underhill entrance situation. In exchange, like for not taking you in, like the strays that you're staying with, like I wanna know all about them. Like I wanna know the details about them. Like that's the deal. And she's like, okay, that's fine, that's the deal. And so he like comes up to her close. She thinks that he's about to kiss her and then all of a sudden he kisses her in the eye. And she's like, what the heck? Like, why did you do this? He's like, well, you did that to me. Like, I'm just paying it back. And right after he left, like this bird comes in the window and Ruby had used the bird 
as like a liaison and used his voice and said like, I trust the grandson of Lou. Did you no harm? Uh, I need you to come meet with me. So Ruby knew that Folin was there. And so he holds out like this pipe and says like, do you agree that this is a pipe? And she's like, yeah, it, it looks like a pipe. It appears to be a pipe. And so he like starts to like, he just holds the pipe and then all of a sudden it turns into like a metal goblet. And he says, do you agree that this is a goblet? And she says, well, it appears to be a goblet. And he says, the appearance, yes, but look closer. And she says, okay, well, the essence is still the same. And she looks closer and she's like, this is an illusion. And he's like, it is. I wonder what might happen when your magic meets the illusion. And so she kind of, she opens her magic a little bit and like a little string of magic goes and hits this and the illusion shatters. They just kind of sit there and he's like, so we do know that your magic just dispelled an illusion or put another way, it destroyed a lie with no effort on your part. And he's like, does that kind of like put things in a place of what happened a week ago? Like she had destroyed Underhill a week ago. And he's like, yeah, the powerful like to use innocent as scapegoats. And it just like dawned on her that she didn't destroy Underhill at all. She destroyed the illusion of it, which is like mind blowing in itself because you're like, like they are basically creating this whole thing because what the Underhill like died a long time ago. And that's what we hear about or that's what we learn about is that the Underhill has been gone for years and the king and queen know about it. And they just have created this illusion to make it so that their kind is okay and don't freak out and to maintain the peace. And while they like try and figure out how to restore the access to it. And so the king and queen leave the Unimop, they leave to go to this entrance to kind of siphon their power into it. So as Faye go into this illusion, they still get that power in them. So they think that it's still Underhill. They of course need someone to blame it on and freaking Allie destroyed the illusion. So of course they're going to put this on her that she destroyed the whole thing. The next day, Allie goes, hey, I'm gonna go train the strays. And so once she gets to the certain area, there's all these, there's about 30 men Ali immediately says like, hey, we need to open the side ice up, like no magic. And so she's like starting to train these guys. I don't know the kind of strategies she's going for, but she's gonna make them work. Drake is there, he's working really hard. And then there's this guy with the hood over his face, like he has potential. There's this guy a little bit later on that says like, can we start a fire? Like we're freezing. And she's like, well, when the task is done, like you can have fire and what remains of the food. So he calls her a B word. And he's like, you're a hungry power, a power hungry B. And I'll say it even if the others won't. So she like basically starts fighting him. Like he comes at her and she fights him. Basically, he just does not respect her. And so she's like, you need to leave. And anyone who will not take my lead, you need to leave. And so he's like, come on, everyone. Like, we don't need her. Come on. But nobody else moves. So he like stomps off or whatever. And like the rest of the guys keep going and, uh, chopping through this ice and they finally get done. And so then at this point she had already started a fire and they peel off their clothes. So she starts to check Drake out because he's an attractive man and he's peeling off his clothes. He has like a really nice body. And then the guy with the hood, um, he starts to take his off and she is like staring at him. And it was like, oh no. And it is freaking Folin. And Drake was like, oh yeah, here's the new guy. I forgot to tell you about him. He goes by Lan. Folin is now in the group of people. Somehow he got into the ranks or whatever. As they're heading back to camp, he asks like, what has you so worked up? And she's like, oh, okay, so it couldn't be the a-hole using me to gather information for the Unseelie Corps. Basically, you just threw me in in another curveball. I mean, maybe. I'm just guessing that's probably what it is. And so they kind of like argue and he he moves, goes away. And then Drake shows up and they're like flirting together. So they kiss and like they kind of make out and everything. It's cute. Allie goes to see Ruby and he and she's like hey i gotta i gotta talk to you and and he's like are you for referring to the presence of our unseelie friend and he's like what worries you about his presence so he already knows that Fulan was there 
And he said that like he's been talking to the other leaders in the triangle and they feel that it's pretty important for all of the Thay in the triangle to gather, especially if the Unseely and the Seely are coming together against the strays. And so he's like, you know, although we prefer to spread ourselves out, we're stronger together. And then he goes on to say like, hey, the Seely King has sent a missive that, you know, if Underhill isn't restored by the spring equinox, like he's going to send an army to wipe all of us out like who lives in the triangle so and she's like okay so we aren't just gathering people we're basically making a run for it and she asks like how can that happen if Fulan is with us like he'll know where we are he says okay well there's going to be a point of no return like a crossroads and it's there like Fulan can he's no longer welcome with us so you need to make sure that something happens to him later that day um Allie goes out and she sees these two guys like brawling and this one guy is just clutching his head and he starts to he starts to speak in tinglet and he says the spirits they'll come for you on the night of the full moon be ready that night she can't get to sleep and she just has this instinct after like a little bit she finally like listens to her gut. So she gets up, she puts out her feelers like with her magic and she sees a fae that was cloaking and walking around. She follows this fae. She sees that it's Yarrow that's talking to this person and this person is actually Bracken. So that girl from the training. So it's Yarrow and Bracken. Yarrow says like, then that fool Ivan spoke the truth after all. So remember the guy from the training or like the the recent training with all the strays that he got mad and he walked off. His name was Ivan. So this Ivan ran to Yarrow and basically spilled like the whole trail that they're going to be going on and like all these different things. So Yarrow was like, now we take them. So Allie runs back to the camp and he's like, hey, time to go. Like the Seelie are coming to kill us in our sleep. So that wakes everyone up. She's able to get everyone ready um, by the time Yaro starts yelling, like, Outcast Fae, surrender to the Seely Corps in the name of King Alexander. Oh, you're harboring a criminal Fae who wanted, who's wanted for her crime against the Underhill. And so then they, they start fighting. So Allie is, is fighting, like, a lot. She sees Bracken again. She's like, Bracken, what are you doing? And she's like, I didn't have a choice. Like, I, he put his influence on me. Like, I can't go against his influence. And he believes that this is his chance to surge up in the ranks before his time. So this isn't even from the King Alexander. And so Ali goes back to the fight and Yarrow is fighting Drake. Basically says like, oh, miss your hand and being like a jerk. And so then Ali takes over and she's like, King Alexander didn't order this attack at all. Like you're going to be executed. Ruby stops them all. And he's like, hey, return to your king. Tell him of the decision you made here today. If you're wise, then you'll learn something. Yara like turns and, and runs. And Allie's like, oh, we should have just like killed him. The next day, Allie goes to Ruby and was like, Yaro's going to try something else. I know him. I trained with him for eight years. Let me, let me go and kill him. Let me figure out what he's doing. And so the next morning, uh, Ruby gets them ready to go and find Yarrow. He's in the West and you'll find him like at a small river town in that direction and, and be safe. So, so her and Folin start to run towards this area. So they, they look down onto this river and it's a human cruise ship and it's surrounded by Fae and they're tossing out these barrels that they're like, that's glimmer. So Glimmer is basically a deadly plant brought from the Underhill that explodes upon like contact with anything. So they were able to like stabilize it though in powder form, but it doesn't like blow up without fire. Yarrow's going to blow up the cruise ship and frame the strays. So they like rush down and they are trying to clear like all these barrels. All of a sudden Folin is there and he's like, what are you doing still on board? Like they are about to explode this. And he like pushes her off the boat into the water and she like comes up and she's like, jump. And all of a sudden it explodes and she like gets caught underwater, everything. She gets shoved to the bottom and she comes back up and he's gone. He comes out. Yarrow is just there. He turns and he's like, hello, mutt. Because he knows that she's there. And so they start fighting and she is, she bests him. And she looks up and all of a sudden sees this like, 
magic, like this strange gray magic. And she realizes it, that it's really old, like it's an ancient magic. And so she like does this sign of peace or whatever that they do. All of a sudden this fae comes out and he is what the humans call Bigfoot. So just imagine uh, Bigfoot coming out. He was watching the whole fight. She says like, here you go. And basically offers Yarrow to him. Yarrow gets eaten by Bigfoot, which is kind of funny. She moves back towards like the cruise ship just to see if she can help. And she sees this figure on the bank of the river and he turns and they see each other and it's Folin. He survived. And it's so cute because this phrase is like, and then they were running to each other, both of them sprinting like they were in a race for their lives, wrapped her arms around his neck, hugged him close, gasping back a sob. I thought you died. And his, his arms snake around her waist. He buries his face against the neck. I couldn't find you after I thought I'd been too slow. It's so cute because they like are trying to hate each other, but once they thought each other was dead, like they were so sad. And he presses his forehead against hers, like, and she could feel him like fight the bindings of like their magic weaving together. All of a sudden, like they start kissing and it's so cute and they love each other. They don't say that they love each other, but it's very like, it's great. And all of a sudden she like gets taken, like grabbed and separated and her magic just kind of like goes crazy. And she's in this mindset, like I need to be returned to him. And so she kind of goes crazy and like kills one of the guards, like it had just consumed her. They say like, oh, like we need to kill her. Like she lost herself to the madness. She's like, no, it, I mean, she didn't say this, but in her head, she's like, it it wasn't madness that took me. Like it was a weird feeling. But then she realizes that like she killed an innocent and madness or not, like the penalty for that is all known to Faye. Like they, they die. And so he like has all these guards. They're, they're his guards, the unseely guards that were trying to find him that are now out of like Yaro's in trance, I guess you could say. So he's like, hey, go back to the cruise ship. So it's just them. And she's like, okay, like she bows her head. She reaches up and like parts her hair at the nape of her neck. So the blow would be clean. She's like, you know what? Please tell Cynthia that I love her. Like, please like tell her that like I did my best. And she, in her head, she's like, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, hadn't told him that I love him since I was a child. He's the one person that got me through training. Like I wanted to prove him so, prove him bad so badly. He's like, I can't do it. Like you have to run, Calic. Like run to the sanctuary, wherever it is. Pray that it's well protected enough to keep you safe. Like Ruby, he can calm you. Like he's gonna keep you safe. Like go and find him. And she's like, no, I'm not gonna endanger my friends. I have to find the entrance to the underhill. Like I have to, like if you're letting me go, that's my only hope. Like I need to finish what I came here for. He's like, okay, well, I I want to go with you. Like the unseelie queen said, like I would need to understand the underhill before the end of my journey. Like underhill lives and is sentient and the entry can be found anywhere it chooses. It creates the weakness in the veil that allows us to pass through. Like you only have to be worthy to open the entrance. He's like, she only gave me this one thing to go and like, I have to go this, like we'll figure it out together. And she's like, no, I have to do this on my own. Like the Seely King and Unseely Queen, like they already are aware of what happened. Like they're going to see Yarrow. They're going to say that the stray did this. Like they're, this is what that's going to happen. Like, I know I can find the underhill and can stop it. And so she's like, okay, I need to find the heart of the underhill. And the triangle has always hosted the underhill. And so she thinks like, okay, I need to go to the heart of the triangle, which is the deepest and like most dangerous area. This is probably where it is. And so she gets to the river to like wash off and she takes like a little nap and she wakes up and the moon is so bright. And that's when she realizes like, okay, like this is a full moon, which the spirit said, as Allie is looking at this full moon, she looks down, there is the, the moon is, is shining bright and it's shining down through a gap of the trees and it had illuminated a path leading west. She hears like these voices that say like the entrance opens to those who are worthy. The the spirits are angry, but they'll guide you. And she realizes like, yeah, it's the full moon tonight, spring equinox, like there's magic in the air. Like I, she knew that it wasn't a coincidence um, that she dreamed of her mom. And so then she sets 
foot on the shimmery path and leads it. And she is running really fast, like following this like little spirit that appeared. Then all of a sudden she hears like this, this bolt past her and then another bolt slams into her right shoulder and so spins her to the ground and she hears this growling and all of a sudden there's like these fey hounds after her which are basically like our type of werewolves and so she's asking like spirits guide me like help me and all of a sudden like the light of the moon brightened on the path and it veered left so she immediately went in that direction there's another fey hound there and he like bites her wrist and there's like a light that flash and a sensation of electricity like seared through the bite. And all of a sudden this dog is gone. Like he's just on the ground dead. So she's like, wait, electricity? Like was that powerful bolt of magic? Like all I knew was the power hadn't come from me or the hound. And the spirit is like, you need to hurry. Like, come on, like, let's hurry. Like she keeps talking to her. Like the spirit keeps talking to her and says like, Underhill wishes you to succeed. Her power is legendary. And so as she's running, her shoulder starts to feel numb and she realizes that the bolt had a sedative in it and as she mumbles it all of a sudden the the spirits are like like mad because they weren't covering her noise and so all of a sudden the spirit like stops by this tree and points to like a massive tree and there's a doorway like a doorway is etched with the symbol of underhill because the spirit knows like these other fae are about to get her like they can hear her and so but she gets really drowsy and she just is not making sense and so Folin is there she wakes up and she's in like this room Folin is there with another guy and and the guy's like let's just kill her let's just kill her and she's like he's he says no the queen specifically asked me to watch over her and this guy is just like berating him like come on like let's just kill her and Folin just kind of explodes and he's like she's not a nobody she's the bastard daughter of the Seely King like we don't know what the queen wants with her. I know her orders, like our job is to obey them. All of a sudden, Bress comes in, the the trainer, and he's like, hey, I'm gonna take over for now. Like she is Seely. Like I'm gonna take her to the king. And he like throws her over her shoulder. They get to the throne room and the king is there, of course, with the queen, but she like hates her. And the king is like, why did you flee? Like, why did you go to the triangle? Like, what is happening? And she's like, you know what? I decided that life in the Sealy Court was not for me. And the consort, their wife, the wife is like, uh, you expect us to believe that? You think we're that foolish? Allie looks straight at her dad because the king is her dad and says like, I know the Fae are in trouble and that everything possible must be done to prevent what would be a horrific fate for all. I know that there are enemies everywhere. And the king kind of like looks at her like, yeah, like he just kind of looks like comforted almost and says like, yes, Calic, I, I agree entirely. And then he says like, hey, take her to this guest chamber, like treat her great. The queen like leans over to him and she is kind of like throwing a fit and he just like looks at her like just demand in his eye and she like lowers her eyes and bows her head to him and he's like it is time and so later that night they have this like feast or whatever Ali is there the king comes in he doesn't spare a glance for like anyone Adair who is the the queen she like is very subdued she goes over to like this large man which is the king's brother so Ali's uncle Joseph I guess and so she stops there which is a strange thing to do to Ali she's like talking to this uncle and a sad smile like trips over his face and then he looks away and all of a sudden the king is up on the stand or whatever and he's like hey like well not hey he like he speaks better but he says like Tonight, I've called each of you to bear witness to a mon monumental occasion. And he basically lies and says, like, just over a fortnight ago, I sent a force of Seely to the Triangle to investigate the demise of Underhill, as you know. What I did not impart is that we sent an elite fae ahead of them to discover how Underhill might be restored. This fae has unique set of skills and came highly recommended by her trainer, which is a full-blown lie. He says, like, but also, like, there was another reason this elite fae was selected. Her station has been closely guarded secret because her childhood allowed her to grow up in safety so that she might understand all the fae here on Unimog. Um, It's a privilege now to reveal the truth to my court at last. And he, like, holds his hand out to her and says, like, may I present my sole daughter and heir to the Seely Throw, Calic of House Royal. She is kind of just, like, shocked right there. And all of a sudden, there's, like, this noise, and there's a 
the spirit's whisper echoes in her mind that says death comes and Allie looks over as her dad's hand goes limp because there's an arrow in his throat. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So he announces her as this as his heir and all of a sudden he's dead. He has an arrow through his throat. <laughs> like oh my gosh like if that didn't like make me like gasp like it did it did make me gasp because I was like what now like seriously what now and so then like the next chapter like she's in jail obviously because the queen was like oh my gosh arrest her it's all because of you like later that night Allie dreams and her dad comes to her in her dream and still and says like you can still save them. And so she's like, still save who? And her dad says, like, our people, they are lost in the wilderness. Like, your name is Tinglet, chosen by the woman who carried you for nine months, who loved you for five years and loves you still. And she's like, you mean my mother? And he's like, no, you know the meaning of your name, right? It means lightning. Like, it means lightning or lightning strike. And his body, like, kind of shimmered and his her mother steps out of the shadows. She says like when a, a forest is dry and dead, it can be burned up by a single bolt of lightning. The lightning starts a fire that cleanses the forest and allows for new growth, like healthy growth. And she says to Allie, like you are that spark, like your father knew it, so did your mother. And Allie's like, what? You are my mother. And then she looks at the king like, what? And the king turns to her mom and says, like, she'll understand soon. Is her mother not her mother? Obviously, I mean, this is, like, basically the end of book one. But it's like, who's her mom? Like, hello? Like, does she have powerful magic? That's what Ruby was saying. Okay, then who is her mom? She wakes up the next morning and they tell her, like, yeah, the queen wants you to be drowned. And she's like, oh, of course she does. So she, like, goes... They take her to this big tank in the middle of like the courtyard or whatever. They like chain her to the bottom. She's like down there, like she's holding her breath and she like looks out through the glass and there's synth right there. And she's like, hold on, hold on. And then there's like commotion above them. She starts thinking like lightning. Can I do lightning? Like, is this like what I can do? Because she can't use her magic right now because she's in iron shackles, which iron absorbs the magic and is very bad for Faye. So she can't use this magic, but she's like, I, I need to like get out of here. So um, her magic like spools around her and like throughs her and it like deepens in color like filling the pool, the tank shatters with this massive bolt of lightning. It just explodes. There's like her rescuer grabs her and she's like synth because she can't really see. It's actually Folin. And he's like, she's coming. Don't worry about her. Like we've got you, your majesty. We've got you. Okay. That's the end of book one. What a whirlwind. We knew that she was the heir to the king and now she is what? The queen? I don't know if the consort or the queen or whatever actually gets the throne because she was married into it. Like, I think Allie gets the throne now of the Seely, and we don't know who her mother is, obviously, because her mom was saying, like, oh, your mom, and it's like, wait, you're her mom, so we don't know who her mom is, and the king is dead, Folin and Synth came after her, I don't know where they're going, maybe to find Ruby, yeah, that's what we know so far, I'm gonna be reading book two this week, and next week podcast is going to be on book two, so stay <laughs> I mean, if you want to read this book, I recommend reading this book before like next week if you can. And if you get done with it, like read book two, like read ahead. Like I want to talk about this with you and I'm so excited to. So I am so grateful for you guys and keep listening, keep sharing, follow me on Instagram, find me in a book podcast and follow along because I am so excited to start talking about book two. So anyways, thanks guys. Have a great Thanksgiving. 